So we are able to hear because we have the organ of corti. The trick is to move the hair cells right here. In order to do that, we need to move the basilar membrane. When we move the basilar membrane, the hair cells are going to move because the tectorial membrane is basically fixed. So how do we move the basilar membrane? By moving the fluid that we have inside this uh, cochlea. Okay. So if we um, scroll down, so we can see right here the hair cells, tectorial membrane, having there a nice figure of, uh, showing you the hair cells and physiology of hearing. So how were we able to hear? We can do that by looking at some figure. For example, uh, we produce sound waves with our vocal cords. The sound waves go through the air and they go inside our auditory canal. They bounce against a tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane vibrates. The vibration is transmitted to the malleus, incus, and stapes, and the stapes is connected to the oval window that is going to transfer that vibration inside your cochlea right here. Now, in the cochlea, the vibration of the trilateral bones is transferred inside into the fluid in the form of waves. The waves are going to go through the perilymph right here, and that perilymph is going to move the vestibular membrane. The vestibular membrane moves the endolymph right here in the cochlear duct. The cochlear duct goes and moves the basilar membrane in the uh, scala tympani. By moving the basilar membrane, as we said, we are going to move the hairs. The hairs open channels for potassium, and that initiates a depolarization that sends the information to your brain using this nerve, which is going to be the vestibular cochlear nerve. So going back to the physiology of hearing, or how do we hear it, because we say the middle ears, we have the three little bones, transfer the information inside your uh, cochlea, and inside the cochlea we have the cochlear cells that are, need to be stimulated, and we already explained that. Right here is the same information, other ear sound waves, vibration here, and then right here is waves. In the fluid and that moves the basilar membrane that eventually transfers the information to the hair cells and from the hair cells into your brain. So we scroll down right here they are showing you how the hair cells move open channels for potassium to initiate the depolarization. Scrolling down sensory coding you don't need to know that but that is what help us identify for example different kinds of I mean if something is very loud or is not that loud Right, I mean soft sounds and loud sounds, for example, and because the tectoral the membrane is stimulated in different areas. But again, you don't need to know that. Cochlear tuning is the ability of our ears to uh, allow us to hear some sounds better than others. But again, you don't need to know that either. Now, this part you need to know how the information goes up to your brain, and in here you can see that we said everything for hearing is in the cochlea. The cochlea uses a vestibular cochlear nerve to send information to the brainstem from the brainstem to the thalamus and from the thalamus into the primary cortex uh, auditory area. Okay, let's keep scrolling down. Our next topic is equilibrium. There are two main types of equilibrium, static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium. Okay, and let's take a look at the figure in here. So we scroll down. We have this part right here, which is called the vestibule, and this part right here, which are called the semicircular organelles. The vestibule is for uh, static equilibrium. Semicircular canals are for dynamic equilibrium. Okay. In the vestibule, we are going to have two structures. Okay. These structures are going to be called the macula, as you can see right here. So, if you look at this figure right here. Again, same concept. What we need to do is we need to move the hair cells. Okay. In static equilibrium, uh, we can talk about uh, something called linear acceleration, which is the movement. But for example, when you're inside your car, okay, when you're inside your car, for example, you use this one, it's horizontal. So you're inside the car, you don't move, but the car moves. Basically, it's a movement from left to right. Okay, left to right. So then, how do you know that the car is moving? because your, your utricle will help you understand, will help you realize that even though you are not moving uh, you know, by yourself, but the car is moving and that's gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to identify that due to the fact that we have that utricle. Now, what happens when you're inside an elevator? Same concept. You're inside the elevator, you don't move, but the elevator moves. How do you know that you're moving? Because in this case, the saccule, which is vertical, will help you with that. Again, when you move either with the saccule or with the utricle, either up and down or left and right, in that case, 
the movement will move your utricle or your saccule and then this gel right here will lag behind and because it lags, lags behind it will move the hairs and when it moves the hairs it initiates the transfer of information to your brain so this is for left and right and up and down and sometimes it's also called linear acceleration okay so if you just scroll down we're going to look now at the semicircular canals in this case semicircular canals are not for linear left and right or up and down in this case it's when you are turning like for example when you are uh inside sitting down on a chair and that chair uh, uh swivels right it starts turning around then that's when you use the semicircular canals. In this case, the concept is the same. You have a gel. In this case is called Cristan pilaris. And inside the gel, you have a hair with cells, right? Hair cells. What's the concept? Again, move the hair cells, okay? So then what happens is when you turn around, depending on the plane that you're moving, right? For example, this person is turning around. So then your body is gonna help you identify where you are turning or how you are turning because depends on the plane that you are moving and because of that we have these three different canals in different positions that will help us identify in what direction you are uh, turning. What happens is that when you turn the fluid inside this tube is going to push the crystal pilaris as you can see right here and then this pushing is going to be able to move the hairs and when the hairs move the hair cells in here capture the information and they send the information to your brain using this nerve, which again is going to be the vestibular cochlear nerve. So if we scroll down, we can see there how the information goes up to your brain. And we said it right here that the information will go from your vestibular cochlear, using your vestibular cochlear nerve into your thalamus, I mean, uh, to your brain stem from there to the thalamus and from there into the vestibular cortex that is going to help us uh, identify or maintain equilibrium. Uh, don't forget that there are three areas in your body that are going to help you with equilibrium. One of them is the ears, the other one is the cerebellum, that's what you see here being depicted, so you can see that, and also the eyes, that's what you can see here, eye movement in here is very important. So we have three different areas to maintain equilibrium, one of them is the eyes, the other one is the cerebellum, and the last one is going to be the uh, ears. Okay, so we're scrolling down, and that's about it. Okay, the next topic in this chapter is going to be vision. We are able to see light. And as you can see right here, right, this is a light. And vision is a perception of uh, objects in the environment by means of the light that they are going to emit or reflect, right? That's very important to understand. If there is no light, we cannot see. So right here you have the eyes. And in here you can see that the white part is the sclera. This part right here with the color of your eyes, it's going to be the iris, and this area right here is going to be your pupil, the black part in the middle. Okay, so if we keep scrolling down, you can see there the same thing. We can see that the iris and the pupil are covered by this crystal and translucent area called the cornea. As we said, the white part is the, con the uh, conjunctiva, which is what you have right here, or sclera as we mentioned before also right here they are showing you that we have the lacrimal glands the lacrimal glands produce a lot of tears in order to clean your eyes it also has uh, substances such as immunoglobulin a in order to defend us right they are produced they produce the tears and the tears come out of the eyes through the lacrimal sac uh, into the nose through the um, nasal lacrimal duct right here okay so if we scroll down we can see that in addition to those structures, we are going to have muscles associated with the eyes. So if these are the eyes right here, we have muscle on top. This is going to be called rectus. So this is superior rectus down here, inferior rectus down here, medial rectus, lateral rectus. We also have an oblique on the top, means superior oblique, and another oblique at the bottom inferior oblique. This muscle moves move due to the fact that they are associated with nerves. In the case of superior oblique is the trochlear nerve, lateral rectus is the abducens nerves and all the other nerves are going to be moved with the oculomotor nerve. Don't confuse these nerves that move these, the, uh, the eyes with the optic nerve that is going to give us the ability to see. If we scroll down, we can see the anatomy of the eyes after the eyes have been cut, so you can see the inside. So right here you can see there is a space, 
called the anterior chamber between your cornea and the lens, which sits right behind the pupil. Okay, behind the lens, you have this other space where you're going to have the vitreous humor. Okay, right here in the front, you have aqueous humor. Right here, you have the vitreous humor. Now, if you look at this part right here, this is the wall of your eyes. Okay, it has three layers. You can see here external, middle, and inner layer. Okay, they are called tunics as well in some books. They're gonna see, you're gonna see them as tunics. This external area, is going to be the sclera. The middle area is the one that is going to be, uh, is going to have a lot of blood vessels as you can see here. Okay, it's a very vascular area. This middle part is also called the uvea. And well, the, this middle layer, it has three main parts. The choroid, which is this part in brown, where you have a lot of blood vessels. As you can see here, it continues with the ciliary body, which is going to be the second part. And the third part is going to be the iris. The ciliary body produces this muscular mass that is going to be able to hold the lens in place, okay, using the suspensory ligaments. So what's the job of the lens? The lens sits behind the pupil and it allows to adjust the light, therefore move that lighting before it reaches the back of your eyes. The inner layer, right here in yellow, is what we're going to call the retina. The retina is where we have the receptors that will help us uh, allow or it will allow us to see. So right here we have an anterior chamber where we have the vitreous humor, I mean the aqueous humor, and right here on the back we're going to have the vitreous humor. Right here you can see the beginning of the optic nerve. So don't forget that the inner layer is the retina. So if we scroll down, we said in there the tunics, we said we have three have the outer or fibrous layer, a vascular layer in the middle, and in the inner is the uh, tunica interna, which is where the retina is. Okay, so, op so optical components, we said we have aqueous humor right here in the anterior chamber, and right here is we're gonna have the vitreous uh, humor. In the anterior chamber, we have aqueous humor. So we keep scrolling down, you can see in there the lens, neural components, Okay, see here, this is your retina. In your retina, this is the area where the nerve is, and this area right here is the area that will allow us to see detail. So where the nerve is located is called the optic disc. This area is orange, and this will allow us to see everything. This is what we consider the peripheral vision. This area where all these receptors are going to concentrate, they're gonna be the macula lutea. The very dark area right here is gonna be the fovea centralis that is gonna give us the uh, detailed vision, right? or the ability, for example, to read. So this is peripheral vision. This is visual acuity. So we scroll down, we have in there the figure showing us the fovea centralis, the optic disc. So we keep scrolling down. Formation of an image obviously is going to be on the back of your eyes. Right here, we can use this figure so the light goes inside your eyes, go through your cornea, through your lens, vitreous humor, and it goes to the back of your eyes where your retina is. Depending on how far or how close the figure or the image is going to be, your lens is going to adjust, make, and making sure that the right image and is going to reach the retina so you are able to see. So we use this figure to show you how the image is forming here, but this is for refraction. You don't need to know anything about refraction. Okay, so uh, near response, you don't need to know that either. I'm not going to explain something that is not necessary for you. We keep scrolling down, same thing with refraction. No, we need to know this part, for example. Now, this is the retina. What do you have in the retina? The receptors. What are the receptors? The rods and the cones. Okay, so these are the receptors that you have in your retina. In addition to that, there are other cells such as ganglion cells and bipolar cells. So if we keep scrolling down, we can see here figures of these receptors. One receptor is the cones and the other one is the rods. Cones is for a lot of light, rods are for a little bit of light. Cones are, for example, during a sunny day, and rods are, for example, for spaces where there's not a lot of light, dim light, let's say. Remember that if there is no light, we cannot see. We also have to remember that some people can read, for example, but they cannot identify colors. If you scroll down, we can see there is a test called Ishihara's test for that purpose, which is this and that is it.